microphone. How we doing this evening? Everybody doing good? That's awesome. I'm glad everyone is here, present. I want to thank you for your time, interest, and being with us in an environment of deference. And so before we get into Don't Write Me, King Me, what I'll do is like, I would like to do an uh, icebreaker. And so it's going to require some participation from the audience. But I'm someone that believes there's a rhythm to life. And I would like to know uh, your theme song for today. The and while you think about it, I will share with you mine. And so today, I'm feeling rather Nipsey Hussle, <laughs> right? Shout out to Nip, that's IP. Um, but I'm feeling the song Dedication, and it's a verse uh, that really resonates with me, and I'll share it with you. Red rose in the grave, play, red rose in the grave pavement. Young black man trapped, and he can't change it. No, he a genius, he just can't claim it because they gave him no platform to explain it. He gets frustrated, so he gets faded. But deep down inside, he know you can't fade him. How long should I stay dedicated? How long the opportunity meet preparation? I need some real nigga reparations before I run up in your bank just for recreation, dedication. That's my song for the day, because that's the story of my life. And that's why I want to give a big shout out to Kevin, also Craig, for creating this environment, this space, uh, where we can have intentional collisions uh, to come together, to learn from each other, and to grow our business. So let's give Kevin and, and Craig a round of applause first. Now, who's willing to share with me uh, their theme song for the day? You don't have to do the verse thing, but just share with me, you know, why it resonates with you. I'm going to teacher mode and pick someone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mine is not really for the day, it's more for my life. We like the band in my household called AJJ, and they have a song called People, and the line from that that I think of very frequently is that it goes, people are people um, regardless of religion, people are people regardless of creed, people are people regardless of anything. I love that, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, is there one more person that would like to share? Nobody? Okay, I won't pick on nobody. I won't go into teacher mode. I'll be kind. <laughs> and so my name is Naeem Alameen. Uh, I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm on the JEDI board for Big Brothers and Sisters, or Justice, Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion. Social entrepreneur. I'm on the Reparations Committee for Kansas City, Missouri. Also, I'm the founder and CEO of Swag, Inc. Um, but what I've been most of my life is a returning citizen or someone who's returned to the community after a prison experience. And so Don't Write Me, King Me is a docufilm or educational efficacy tool designed to eliminate ignorance and elevate knowledge on mass incarceration's impact on black histories and black futures. And so we're gonna explore the building blocks of mass incarceration and also a call to action. Um, but point of information, Don't Write Me, King Me is actually a chapter out of my memoir, Returning Citizen from Debtor to Owner, which is an illustration of mass incarceration's impact on my life. And so me and my creative team over at JWA Marketing, we were able to take a chapter out of my unpublished book, create a docu-film, and share the messaging of diversity, equity, inclusion for returning citizens, for black people, and also it created a revenue generating model. And so corporations, organizations, book me, retain me to teach this. And also, um, tickets are available on Eventbrite. And so, um, I hope you enjoy. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Imagine with me, if you will, close your eyes, being that young kid, 
on a walk through your neighborhood. Uh, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell? Did you feel safe? The fact that I had to do anything is what I'm getting at. Safety is a moment. Security is the status. Don't Rodney King me. The Rodney King meeting of 1991 would be an act description of every black person in America at the time that this happened. It was a reference to the duality of existence that W. Du Bois so eloquently wrote about, down to the prophetic affirmation that the problem of the 21st century would be the problem of the covenant. It was a lowering of the curtain of qualified immunity doctrine rationalized by the Supreme Court on this problem child. It was a beat-down submission to our place in the social stratification of America. It was a reminder that the Constitution of America stands as one of the most hypocritically flawed documents to be revered if the very people that made all the sacrifices we so proudly enjoy are left out of it. The Rodney King beating of 1991 was why I was since arrested for a robbery at eight years old. Never been to talk to a counselor or a social worker. Nah, an eight-year-old kid attempted to rob an old Mexican man who had more likely did not experience more loss than him. It's not an indicator for help or an indicator that something is wrong here. Mass incarceration will attempt to fit you into his narrative. The Rodney King beating of 1991 was softened upon that the dog threw to put me onto the road of 60s neighborhood crib game. The Crenshaw district would become my home and the road of 60s would become my family. Mass incarceration tends to operate in fear. Generally when you're fearful of something, you seek shelter and hide. Mass incarceration will present you in the eyes of the duality of existence as Rodney King. I bury young and old Rodney Kings that have been beat down by Matt McCarson. They could to feel that I was up next for my home and he would do the terror. And when they ran out of land for the victims, they started building skyscraper mausoleums. As I stared into that TV screen, watching all those white officers, hearing the sounds of the radio and blood copter and a muffled voice of the reporter, I just remember images and my ass in mind. I couldn't wait to kill all of those motherfuckers. They were beating down my future by making me help want to destroy it. And George Holliday used the camera to record the March 3rd, 1991 assault. 30 years later, George Holliday can be quoted on NBC as saying, the same issues surrounding King's beating still seem to be occurring decades later. Racial tension is there. The video he captured is approximately one minute, 10 seconds. Things have gotten worse. Eight minutes, four seconds for George Floyd. And taking one minute, 10 seconds, mass incarceration is looking to finesse you for eight minutes, four seconds until you is getting better. So thank you for viewing that. Um, before we get into the building blocks of mass incarceration and the call to action, what I'd like to do um, is for everyone to close their eyes and imagine, and I'll join you, uh, being that young kid from your neighborhood. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you smell? And could you differentiate between safety and security? Take a couple seconds to think about that. And so if someone would be willing to share what they, if they, if they could differentiate between security and safety, what did they hear? What did they smell? What did they see in their neighborhood as that young kid? And I definitely um, would like to, to, to listen to that. And I'll share mine um, after that. That's reciprocity at its finest. So is anyone willing to share? with this? Brent Darden. So as the question, <clears throat> when we close our eyes, our eyes, <clears throat> what did we see for our safety? In terms of being that, that young kid in your neighborhood, 
Um, what did you hear? What did you smell? What did you see? And did you know if you were safe or secure? Or were you? Uh, as soon as you said it, first thing I heard was gunshots, sirens, uh, a lot of smoke. So it's kind of like, you know, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Safety, all I seen was the church, my brothers, uh, the Boy, boy uh, Scout Club, and then picnics. All that was just a quick flash when you made me uh, visualize that. So safety was the church, it was the uh, Boy Scout Club, and then the sounds and the smell was smoke and gunshots and sirens. Wow, thank you. And I can identify that and resonate with me too because Brent and I are from two different generations and the same thing is happening, right? That's a problem and that's some of the things that we're going to talk about. And so for me, I believe that it's envir environmental, right? For example, if you take a olive tree seed and if you put it in an environment not conducive to its nature, it's going to perish. It's not going to survive. But if you do the antithesis of that, or the opposite of that, you put it in an environment conducive to its nature, it's gonna thrive. And it may even light up the world. And people are no different. And so for me, I was born in Junction City, Kansas, but I grew up in Los Angeles, California. And it was two different environmental experiences. And so in Junction City, Kansas, I enjoyed my nucleus family. I grew up with my aunties, my cousin, my three siblings, and my mother was present. And so what did I hear? What did I see? What did I smell? Everything that a young, innocent kid, kid could, right, from a little boy's perspective. I was safe. I was secure. Um, I didn't know anything about the police and, you know, those functions. I didn't experience any violence, even though uh, we were ultimately placed in foster care, my siblings and I, through my mom's dysfunction uh, that she was going through in terms of alcoholism, prostitution, and drug use, right? But um, as we went into this new environment, what did I hear? What did I smell? What did I see in Los Angeles, California? So I heard gunshots, <laughs> right? What did I smell? Uh, gun smoke. What did I see? Death of two types, the living dead and those buried underground, right? This is the environment that I was introduced to through the vehicle of foster care. And so in that environment, I was approached by a gang, right? They said to me, hey, we know you just moved into that foster home. Do you know who your dad is? I said, no, I don't. They said, well, we're going to call you unknown. They had me write it on a, ben on a bench as we were, we were in the park. And they said, you have to rob somebody and bring us what you get. If you don't, you can't come back here. And they handed me a 38. Terrified I was, right? I didn't know the language. I hadn't seen an environment like this before. I hadn't, I hadn't been pressured like this before. And so I did it and I failed miserably. I attempted to rob an adult Mexican man. I was arrested, processed, booked, fingerprinted, photographed, and I sat in a cell with grown men. And this would be my introduction into the criminal justice system at eight years old in 1987. So, the question is, why does that have value in our society? How can we arrest an eight-year-old kid? How can the police not see that, you know, this is the youth, right? What allows for that, that to have valuation in our society? And so, in my opinion, it's the building blocks of mass incarceration, which are, for me, the 13th Amendment, the war on drugs, Perceived in civility theory, qualified immunity doctrine, duality of existence, and legislation. And so let's review each of those uh, in brevity in the sake of the economy of time. So in terms of uh, the 13th Amendment, right? Uh, slavery or involuntary servitude shall be abolished except for a punishment as a crime, right? And now we know that this 13th Amendment is a caveat to those who have been excluded from the U.S. Constitution, i.e. black people, <laughs> right? And so uh, that's, that's the first building block, right? Coming out of a system of slavery that crossed the Atlantic trade slave. And so the war on drugs, take that for example, the, coin, the term coined in 1971 by former President Richard Nixon, right, that had imperatives 
eradication, indiction, and incarceration. Indiction, that's to prohibit and to also uh, accost or take away. Who are they doing that to? Well, for example, could it be black people who make up 12% of the US population, but 45 to 50% of the people that are incarcerated? Could it perhaps be that is the focus of the war on drugs? Take, for example, what W.E.D. Du Bois offered in the souls of the souls of black folks in terms of the duality of existence, black people being boutressed up against a veil, right? And that veil was not to assimilate into white culture, but to also not be recognized as a human being, i.e. being left out of the US Constitution, right? These are the things that have impacted my life. Perceived, or excuse me, perceived incivility theory, a sociological perspective that states one can look to their environment to confirm their upper social mobility or the lack thereof. Well, if you're from a community like me that has dilapidated buildings, broken people, broken vehicles, drugs, violence, police brutality, you start to believe that this is the only thing you can ascend to. It's something that's restricted to this environment, right? That's what that begins to look like. That's the perceived, perceived incivility piece. But also then consider the qualified immunity doctrine proffered or authored by the Supreme Court, which allows for protections of police as they infringe on the civil, liber the civil liberties of their citizens. So you take all of this, organize it, in an organized manner through legislation and you implore it on a disenfranchised and oppressed people, right? And, you know, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really a different version of slavery, right? And so what are we doing? Um, yeah, what are we doing? And so the call to action, if you will, for me is that it's about ownership and the way that we arrive through that, arrive at that for black people who are impacted by this is social entrepreneurship. That's a system that we can control without any outside influence of legislation or traditional systems of granting, right? That's important. And so social entrepreneurship, it differs from the traditional entrepreneurship approach. Entrepreneurship is white men in tech looking to scale and sell, right? Social entrepreneurship is starting at the pain points of your client or your customer to produce profitability and purpose in whatever that product or service is, right? And it has five principles. Empathy, ideate, prototype, defined, and test. This is replaces that traditional business plan and we work that out on a lean canvas model. And so what that allows us to do is to create nonprofits that focus on social inequities or for profits in our community that can elevate us, right? That can allow us to elevate the status of people around us, generate revenue, um, and solve for some of these things that are impacting us dramatically in the black community. And so that's the Don't Rodney King Me piece. In the full workshop, what we would do, I would have handed out business plans, and we would have crafted out business models for different parts of the mass incarceration space as a workshop. And maybe even reveal to you that you have a social entrepreneurial mindset and acumen that you didn't know, but now you can tap into and explore, right? And so one thing that has evolved juxtaposition to the advent of social entrepreneurship is foundations that have shifted to trust-based funding, right? And so what that means is that you're looking at the program service, the, the, the problem, the solution, and you're taking away the barriers to getting that work done, right? And so Swag Inc. has been funded by the Hadley Project KC. Uh, we were funded for three years. We're in our third year of funding. We were, the funding opportunity was $100,000 a year for three years, and I never completed an application. I don't owe any accounting. I don't owe any financial reports, right? It's trust-based funding. We believe in you. And we believe that you're going to do what you say you're going to do and you're going to get the work done. So here's the check. Right. And when you look at that coupled against the traditional foundations, as I went through that 
um, process, it wasn't the same, right? It's like 20, 80 program services. What's the, the capacity? How many cohorts? What's this? What's that? And it's like, you know, people is dying. <laughs> what are we doing? You know, we got a food desert. Yeah, we want to start our own grocery store. Like, can you fund that? And then it's these barriers. And so social entrepreneurship is a, a pathway or a vehicle that we can really have ownership in our community. And so with that, I end on the Don't Ride and Kimi piece. Um, do we want to wait for Q&A later and transition into the presentation? Or do you want to? Okay, so yeah, let's go to the presentation. And I have a clicker here. I hope I can use it. <laughs> and so the, de the, de the deconstruction of mass incarceration. Um, this is my personal legend. Uh, your personal legend is the best version of yourself that exists in the universe. Um, and so, you know, for me, I had to climb out of the grave and that would require a 10 rung ladder. And I like to use that symbolism to illustrate, you know, what that upper social mobility looked like for me. And so the rungs on my ladder are the 13th Amendment, disenfranchisement, systemic racism, dysfunction, trauma, poverty, foster care, gang life, and prison. My 10th rung being social entrepreneurship, which created that 1% uh, for me, and that ownership piece that allowed me to introduce, or elevate my status to a founder and CEO, but also uh, introduce an unreasonable business model that allowed me to arrive at untraditional business arrangements and develop relationships that allowed me to decode the language to the fiduciaries and establish trust and um, get our organization funded. And so um, that's that's what that journey has looked like for me. And so I was gonna say next slide, but okay, there we go. <laughs> and so again, um, mass incarceration, that's what we're talking about. It has a real, a true and a technical definition. And earlier you heard me say that I was on the Jedi board for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Uh, justice, equity, diversion, and inclusion. And you know, my role as a board member is to recruit bigs that is show up for littles and help defend their potential. Um, that's my role. And so I wish I could have did that for Antoine. Um, I wasn't able to, And but you know, the, the, the real definition of mass incarceration is that again, it's born out of the social inequities experienced by black people. And so what did that war on the drugs look like in my community? Right, uh, it brought about the evolution of Crips and Bloods and a war thereof. Uh, the militarization of police, it brought about people, um, you know, relying on subservient systems uh, for existence. And, you know, Antoine wasn't, uh, he didn't fare any, vet, any better in that way. Um, and so I'll share part of his story with you. You know, at so eight years old, you know, Antoine was arrested. At nine, he started to, well, he, he seen someone murdered for the first, first time, and he also started to drink alcohol. At 10, he started to run away from the foster care system as he was being molested, you know, by his foster parents and also the other guys in, in the group home. And at 12, he joined one of the largest gangs in Los Angeles, California, in the Rolling 60s Crips as a way to have some semblance of family and protect himself. And you know, Antoine didn't have anyone to defend his potential, to champion for him, or to create environments of deference or platforms. And so ultimately Antoine would experience three prison sentences at 18, 21, and 35. I'm Antoine Tingle 30 years later. And, you know, my journey, you know, has been one that has, you know, and come with a lot of loss um, and a lot of trauma. And so, but the reason I changed my name was a couple of reasons. Um, it was about identity, also about ownership for me at that time in terms of creating a new narrative for myself, right? And so Antoine is, Antoine, well, Tingle, is actually my sister's um, father's last name. My mom didn't know who my dad was, right? And so she gave me my sister's dad last name. And as I got older and I became, you know, I started to pursue 
knowledge of self and go on my journey for the truth, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, create a legacy and I wanted to have my own last name um, and to start that over as it had been lost for me. And so um, that's what I did. But it was also to move away from the, the stigma of mass incarceration. You know, stigma is a public health crisis. So, you know, Antoine Tingle, you know, foster kid, gang banger, drug dealer, uh, ex-con, career criminal, right? I wanted to move away from up under that umbrella, and so I changed my name to Naeem Alameen. And, you know, so Naeem, it means one that is, it means one that is tranquil, but it has a bigger connotation in terms of immense blessings uh, kind of thing. And Alameen, it translates into one that is trustworthy. And so that's what I wanted my, my legacy, my posterity, my prosperity to be founded on uh, was being trustworthy. My environment constructed my reality. And so this is a picture actually. Um, that's me with the big afro right there, second guy from the right, if you can see that. <clears throat> that's on 10th Avenue in the rolling 60s um, in the Crenshaw District. And you know, the Crenshaw District is a place that's right between the cemetery and the penitentiary. And in that environment, um, well, at the time that I came on to that environment, as I said, I got put onto Rolling Sixties in 1992. It was a different epic of time. And so like when you got put onto a gang at that time, you got jumped in, you went and put in work, and then you went and aligned to whatever identity that was gonna be for you in that neighborhood. And so either you're gonna be a drug dealer, you're gonna be a killer, you're gonna be target practice, you're gonna be clickbait, you're gonna be going to jail, uh, you're gonna be pimping. You know, you're gonna have some role that really identifies you. And so for me, that was the drug culture, right? So the homies took me in, taught me how to survive, um, and I came up through the drug economy. And what that looked like for me was, you know, first, <laughs> you know, having been able to develop that relationship. Uh, it's a little different back then. It wasn't everywhere and prevalent like it is, right? It was a taboo and it was associated with a subculture. And it was a way to further, you know, stigmatize. And so anyway, um, you would first have to develop that relationship to secure that package. Then you would have to have a corner to sell that thus product on, right? And then after you perfected that, you move on to a dope spot or a dope house. Uh, and the next uh, rung on that ladder is, you know, going out of town, moving work from state to state, right? And you reach that boss status, that boss level in that way. And that's the trajectory that I came up in. And so what's interesting though, again, the introduction of the war on drugs, what was the Crenshaw district before that? What did that community look like? And so actually, you know, the Crenshaw district is a real historic part of Los Angeles, California. And, and so in that community, the origins uh, is the Black Panthers. So Bunchy Carter, right? He grew up in that community that I'm from and he was a member of the Black Panthers. And so, you know, it was about, and these are the original definitions of Crip and Blood that I'm gonna give you. But it was about community, revolution and progress right, that's Crip, and Blood was better look out or die in terms of the police m militarization of our communities, the occupation, right? And so it was about ownership at that time, and this is the, the energy that the community that I, I grew up in. The war on drugs will alter that definition of Crip and Blood, turn it to blue and red, create segmented geography and territories and you know the violence associated with that drug trade and those things like that and so that's the impact and that's what that looked like uh, for me the construction of mass incarceration again as i said uh this picture here this is i was actually 18 it's the first time i went to prison um and so 18 so let me take that back so the construction of mass incarceration right so being Arrested at eight years old in 1987, going to juvenile hall approximately 1993 when I turned 13, and then going to prison at 18 in 1997, going again at 21 in 2001, and then my final trip to prison 2013 at 35. 
right? That's what that looks like. And so this is a picture of me at 18, and this is a picture of me at approximately 36, 37 in Lansing Correctional Facility, right? And what's interesting is that at 35, you know, uh, being in prison, I had went into prison with three degrees from a D1 university, right? I'm a K-State alum. Ema, every man wildcat, we just knocked off UK too, so there you go. <laughs> um, but um, I have a bachelor's in sociology, criminology, and AS in psychology, and that wasn't enough to influence a criminal justice system not to send me to prison for a crime that I didn't commit. I was in there for a conspiracy to distribute cocaine. And because I didn't testify on the target, which was my friend, and they knew that, you know, uh, they dropped the charges on him and they filed them on me and I received a 68 month prison sentence. And so uh, this is, um, you know, it was very, very, very interesting. And so I was released from prison March 22nd, 2018. And so I'm really excited and happy to bring in my fifth year anniversary home here at Keystone Innovation Center on a platform. <laughs> Thank you, really excited to be on the platform and be able to share my story and have a solution and to be heard. Um, and so I really appreciate you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> And so the the uh, the true definition of mass incarceration. And so this is a picture of my daughter Azra. She's about my youngest daughter. She's about six in that picture or so. And it really broke my heart that she had to walk into a maximum security prison and visit her father. Right? Really broke my heart um, to do that. But I I got an opportunity to to touch her and feel her. And so that was awesome. Um, but you know the real definition, or excuse me, the true definition of mass incarceration is that it's not having a seat at Donuts with Dad Day. I know people here, uh, we may have children, may have a kid, you may have a cousin, niece, nephew, uh, young person in your community, you may even volunteer for an amazing organization like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, right? And so what that looked like for me and my family was calling home, asking my daughter how she was doing, and she said to me, you know, Daddy, I'm um, doing better now, but I wasn't doing good earlier. I said, well, what happened, baby? She said, well, we had donuts with dad day and my seat was empty, but my friends wasn't, right? And just broke my heart, I kind of dropped the phone. And, you know, I, I cried because I knew that my daughter could identify the moment she'd been impacted, right? And this is very significant. And so, again, her father is sentenced April 21st uh, 2014 to 68 months, every player in the courtroom, the judge, the clerk, the bailiff, the prosecutor, the public the pretender, all knew that I didn't commit a crime, but they still sent me to prison. But what about my daughter, Darters? And I often tell people that mass incarceration is less about those that are incarcerated and more about what they leave behind. Family, society, and economy, right? currently behind bars. Um, and so the mass incarceration, the, the technical definition of mass incarceration. The technical definition of mass incarceration is the rate at which a state or a nation incarcerates its citizens, right? That's the technical definition. And unfortunately, Missouri incarcerates more than any known land mass in the universe, right where we at, right? 735 per 100,000 people that outpaces the United States of America and other nations the like thereof. Again, the question is, why does this have value in our society? That's the question. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but I will say this, in Missouri, I will introduce that piece here. In Missouri, there's 22 prisons, numerically 21. But that's outrageous, right? <laughs> 21 prisons, right? But what about the 22nd one? That's the one that they release you into because reentry is like returning from the dead. You release from one prison into another and that prison is really constructed of not understanding and not being understood, right? And that, that could be life or death. So the incarceration rate again reflected. And so for Missouri, there's 
50,000 people incarcerated, 13,000 of those people uh, will be returning. 90% of all people incarcerated will be returning to the community. 2,300 are returning to Jackson County, uh, where Swag Inc. Uh, does his work, where we office out of. And they're returning with no plan. Within the first one to three years, they return to prison, 40 to 70% clip, right? It's outrageous. That's the prison industrial complex, warehousing and churning people. And so, for example, um, as I mentioned, I've been home five years, right? And in terms of recidivism, that's the definition uh, in terms of, you know, leaving prison, coming to the community, and then going back, right? We call that recidivism. And it's actually, we, we, we speak a lot about one to three years on that timeline, but it's actually a 10 year timeline, right? And the fifth year mark is really the mark that is demarcated, that announces that you're no longer recently released, right? So, I mean, it's really impound, I mean, profound and impactful. Like, you know, systems, people, family, you come home, you've been here to home two, three years and they expect you to have it figured out really on day one. But like, you know, it's up until your fifth year. And if you're like me and you serve a five year sentence, anything five years and above from a Department of Correction perspective is considered long term employment, uh, long term incarceration and high on the trauma scale. Right. So the reality is a reentry. Uh, it's like returning from the dead, as I just expressed. So I'm just going to kind of provide a synopsis of my experience, <laughs> this five-year uh, experience. Um, but I want to kind of focus on the week before I came home and the week after. So the week before I came home, I had about, I don't know, five years romanticized what my life looked like. I'm going to get married to my girlfriend. You know, uh, I'm going to be with my daughters. We're going to be in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I'm, you know, everybody's going to my family's going to be helping me build the brand, you know, and, and then life's going to be merry and great, right? And it just unfortunately it didn't happen like that. Um, my first day home, I actually, um, and I don't, really, I don't share this much, but my first day home, <sighs> um, so I made arrangements to meet, you know, with my girl that, you know, supported me over the five year sentence, right? By letter writing, money, visits, phone calls. You know, and there was immense disruption. Like I was six hours away. I was on lockdown for a couple years out of the sentence. So 20, 20 23 hours and, and lockdown and one hour out. So didn't have access to the phone. And it just cut off that, that, that tie to Keith and Ken. But nevertheless, we had dinner. And so like, I've been waiting on her five years, right? You know, I'm like really excited to see her and think that we have an amazing experience ahead of us. And she tells me that, you know, she's dating someone, she's in love with them and they live together. And I'm like, wow, that sucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so what did I do? Uh, after she dropped me off home, I called a cab. I didn't know where I was going, I, but apparently I went to Bacalas on Independence to the strip club and I sat at the bar and I got shit faced. Right, fresh out on parole, not supposed to be drinking, and in fact, I'm I'm scheduled to blow uh, to go into an Oxford house in the morning. And so when I showed up there in the morning, you know, smelling like you know a pub, they were like, you cannot get entry, and so I had to report that to my PO, and then I had one week to figure it out, or I was going back to prison. Right, and so that's what it looked like. Um. But as I transitioned over that hump, um, which is a still still a, a little hump I'm transitioning, uh, but I was hired at UPS um, as an unloader about 30 days after I was released. And within four months, I was promoted to human resources. At the same time, I had been transversing through the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I had a working business plan that I submitted to the C-suite. Shout out to UPS, Eric Day, my manager, um, for supporting that. And so they saw value, allowed me to work autonomously, co-brand UPS, Swag Inc., and focus my hiring initiatives on returning citizens. And that, and we, and I was also working with uh, KCPS. And so I developed a proof and concept for our never go in, never go back piece, right? And so in terms of the returning citizens, I was able to increase retention by 70%, attendance by 50%, and zero recidivism, meaning none of our clients went to prison. In terms of the never go in, working with the youth at Central High School, I increased the graduation rate, attendance rate, 
uh, livelihood and also uh, no poor interactions in or out of school over a year up until COVID. And then we were introduced to the Department of Corrections uh, through that relationship with probation and parole. And we started pitching uh, the Transitional Center of Kansas City to let us come in as a pre-entry model, right? Um, and it was prolific, it was pioneering, no one was doing this. Um, and they didn't even have a warden or a re-entry coordinator, but remember, people are getting out of prison daily, <laughs> right? And they're getting out without a plan. And in this case, they didn't have a warden or a re-entry coordinator. And so after a year of building out that model with them, um, we then recruited like 50 community partners and we had work sessions over a year. In April 22, we went live with the with the program, right? And so that's what what, what that looked like um, in terms of my my um, reentry, what I've been able to do. Um, so it's all about ownership at Swagging. We promote ownership, right? And so there's two definitions of ownership. There's a sociological and an economical. From a sociological perspective, ownership is about uh, being being the best version of yourself, showing up, doing what you say you're going to do, being resilient and having a big heart, right? That's important. Um, from an economical perspective, ownership is about creating a revenue generating model that elevates the status of the people around you while producing purpose and profitability. And that's something that we help develop our clients through education, employment etiquette and entrepreneurship, right? Because like I said, you can you can you can create legacy. You can create a a, a pathway to to um, elevating others, and so that's really important to me. But this is the joblessness, right? We're going into prison not having earned income. We're not earning in prison. In in we're not earning income in prison like I wasn't able to, and you know we're not earning income when we come out. So when are we getting some money? <laughs> right, it's important. So the deconstruction, that inspired me to introduce a new business model, as I said. Um, our approach is to client-based services and a workforce development piece. Never go in, never go back, and we help employers change the way they recruit. But another thing that it allowed me to do from an organizational perspective was elevate people and put them in roles that traditionally been left out, didn't have a chance, and been forgotten about, right? And so we have a 10-member board of directors we have an executive team, we have staff, and then we have our volunteers, right? And so shout out to Brent Darden. He's our executive director uh, for the Never Go Back. He manages the relationships with employers and also our clients. Bro is from Chicago. Uh, he's a social entrepreneur himself. He's the curator of Think to Win Mindset events, right? He's been impacted by mass incarceration. Now he's in C-suites as a decision maker, you know, and helping people that can't help themselves. You know, we have our amazing personal assistant, Tanika Scott, um, here. Uh, been a tremendous help uh, with managing the information flow and my calendar and, and things that I've just been needing for five years, right? But again, <laughs> but again, Tanika uh, is impacted by mass incarceration. And now, you know, she's, in, she, she's attached to a network, right, that, that can influence outcomes, you know, in a, in a pro-social way. And so that's important to us. Um, long term, uh, so where are we at on time? Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, um, where are we at now? Um, again, let me let me uh, take us back to April twenty first. So April twenty first, twenty fourteen. Again, I'm sentenced to sixty eight months, and in fact. You know, I've done everything I needed to do while I fought this bogus case on on bond, right? I didn't pay $100 a week to a bondsman for a uh, uh, ankle bracelet. I've maintained employment. I didn't get any new charges. I even got accepted at KU for the number one program in the country, uh, this master's program in public administration. And it is not my case anyway, my guy. Right, and so I told him, I said, look, can you give me time so I can turn myself in to, to close out my affairs? And he said, no, you're remanded to the Secretary of Corrections immediately. So the next day I woke up, April 22nd, on my 35th birthday with a fresh five-year sentence. But that's a sentence in which I wrote my business plan to Swag Inc. 
And I'm very excited and happy to say that now, April 22nd, will be Swagging Day in Kansas City, Missouri forevermore. <laughs> uh, we were awarded a proclamation uh, from the city signed by Mayor Q. Shout out to Mayor Q, neighborhood revitalization for real, for real, um, to celebrate ownership for people impacted by mass incarceration. And so we have an amazing event planned out at Big Brothers and Big Sisters, April 22nd from 11 to 4 p.m. It's going to be a panel discussion, business pitch competitions, also a screening of Don Rodney King Me, and networking event, food, games. I'm really excited uh, um, for our partners over at Big Brothers and Big Sisters. And so, um, as before I close out, I speak to the revenue generating model. That's the last piece, the way that we work with employers. And so, we, I was able to move us from talent acquisition to talent sourcing. While I was in that role at UPS, I was able to pick up a master's degree in human resource management on the house. UPS paid for that, took advantage of that tuition assistance program. Also, I was a career development executive with the Full Employment Council simultaneously uh, as I worked at UPS. And so what I seen was that it was an opportunity for a nonprofit to create new money and move away from that traditional system of granting donations, fundraising. Right, because it's all about ownership. We want to have control of our destiny, be agile, nimble, and quick to respond. Right, that's what's important to us. And so, we have partnered uh, with three employers: J. E. Dunn Construction, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and also um, Goodwill Industries. And so, um, yeah, with that, I end the presentation and move into Q and A with my guy Kevin. <laughs> I got a question. I got a question. It's my show. I get a question. Yes, sir. Um, so several years ago, I went to Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. It's a museum, right? And, <laughs> and they, they show a lot of the statistics that you talk about in terms of mass incarceration. And the ones that stood out to me were the ones where they showed the United States versus other countries. And I don't think, unless you have that perspective, you can appreciate the, the scale and the situation in the United States. We are, we're very different. I mean, it is, is a, a systemic approach to oppression, like you said. It is, and it's well documented. The statistics don't lie, right? And I walked away from that, and, and you know, I was headed to another museum, right? Walking down the street, and I thought to myself, like the phrase that we often hear of, about certain systems, um, too big to fail right? Like too big to fail, the banking system, too big to fail. Companies, too big to fail. And I thought to myself, there's really only two systems in the United States, and I think it's playing out a little bit right now with democracy. We're not sure if that system is too big to fail or not. Um, but the idea that mass incarceration and the industry that we have behind that and college athletics, to me, those are the two systems that are truly too big to fail. I mean, and, and, the, and for me, college athletics is an industry. If you don't understand that it's an industry, how many people had a team that played in the NCAA tournament, right? And you rock your colors forever, right? And you're loyal to your colors and you stay loyal to your colors forever. And so that industry spans well beyond college athletics, the alumni, all of those things. So I guess all that said, my question for you is, when we think about innovation, we think about the deconstruct, when we think about deconstructing systems, is there any way that this system truly changes or is it the reentry part of it that has, like, is that the only hope we have to change what is an industry in this country that is too big to fail? Um, and so the, the original two systems in the United States, the Auburn and the Penn system, right? In the Auburn system, incarceration was about um, isolation. So one could atone for their wrongdoings, right? Um, but then in the pen system, it was about silence, right? And so the men in the prison, they couldn't talk to each other, they couldn't communicate. And so this is, you know, suppressing the individual person. And then they found out they could make money, right? They allow people to tour uh, the prison and see, you know, what it was like to, to be incarcerated. Right, and so when it became too much of a thing, they raised the price to keep people out, right? And so to your point, is the system too big to fail? Well, I mean, I imagine so when you consider that the war on drugs is the ongoing global campaign, 50-year war, right? Funded at 51 
$1.5 billion annually. You take the, the cost of mass, incar mass incarceration at $80 billion, essentially $131 billion industry that's too big to fail. Well, I mean, we look at some of the brands that actually product comes out of the prison system. I mean, they're some of the biggest brands we know today, you know, that, were, that are actually use this system as a product producing shop, those types of things. We, I don't think people understand the industry that sits behind this and the, the, the revenue generation that sits behind some of the biggest brands that we know today. Right, and so let, um, a great segue into the prison industrial complex, right? So how did it come to mass incarceration? That's the question, right? And so we know that it's born out of the social inequities of black people, right? But how did it get to mass incarceration? The fractured economy, the 1.9 million people that are missing from the workforce, 70% who are in there for a nonviolent drug offense who would otherwise be free, right? And so what we found in this prison industrial complex, it requires bodies to operate, right? And so um, the economical piece is astounding when you consider it, right? Hundreds goes into reentry. Billions goes into incarceration. And then when you, when you talk about the system or reentry, um, wow, thank you for, for asking that. <laughs> because I think one of the, the most left out um, culpable agents in this system is the reentry coordinators, right? And that's who impacted me during my incarceration. We know about the courts, we know about the police, you know, we know about the lawyering, we know about that, um, but the reentry department, people that are in our community, they live here, right? You see them, you know, you, you interact with them, you may have great relationships, but they work in the Department of Corrections and they're not the same person they are in the community when they're there, I'm sure of it, right? They're, they're not doing the reentry plans. They're not addressing the needs of the people and therefore they're putting the community in danger at large. Man, I could sit here and talk to you forever and we're gonna do that at some point in time, <laughs> but we can't do it tonight. Um, again, I mean, the second time you've been up here, thank you for sharing your story. It's inspiring. Uh, I'm, I'm truly amazed. Uh, and, and when I say amazed, I'm amazed that a human that goes through the trauma and goes through the things is willing to commit themselves to the mission of improving that for others that go behind them. And, uh, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being in Kansas city and for doing what you're doing here. Uh, truly appreciate you, man. Thank you, Kevin. I know that. Thank you. Thanks for that.